everybody. After countless requests, I have finally recorded footage of me doing a timing chart and in-betweening demo. Today, I'd love to show you that overall process. Again, in-betweening is the process of tying down the timing and smoothing out the overall movement with your drawings. Check out my previous video about in-betweening to learn more about the concept itself and why it's so important for 2D animation. So without further ado, let's get started. There will be a number of essential things I'd like to address in this video. In this video, we'll be timing our animation within the timeline. Then we'll be applying and utilizing timing charts on our drawings. I'll be showing you guys some important basic skills and techniques that you can use to keep your drawings consistent. For example, I want to show you guys the point to point technique. Next in the actual in-betweening phase, I'll talk about what order to do the drawings in and utilize flipping techniques. I'll discuss things like keeping form and maintaining arcs and dealing with two different timing charts in one drawing. When we have the most basic in-between foundations down on our test, then we can talk about using the light table of areas of very tight spacing. Last thing we'll be doing is correcting and revising some of my in-betweens and explaining why I'm making such changes. Anyways, let's get right to it. The character I'll be using is a mouse named Richard, submitted by Patrick Standard. According to Patrick, he started out as a fan character based on the Secret of Nim universe. Come to think about it, I can definitely see the Don Bluth influence in some of Richard's drawings. Patrick uses Richard for his own animation demos, in which he has done in his own regarding the same in-betweening topic. So to pay honor to that notion, I thought using Richard for the same topic with my own take will be an interesting way to go. Go check out Patrick's work on Patreon at the link below. Also, the man's a beast animator, and clearly his work shows his loving passion for hand-drawn animation. The software I'll be using is TV Paint, but honestly, you can use other softwares like Flash, Toon Boom, any software that's capable of doing animation. Alright, first of all, I want to talk about what we're working with over here. Here's the character that I'm working with, Richard. As you can see, I've already done work with him. To save time, I've already tied down the major key poses and its breakdowns. This is because I want to keep this video more focused on timing charts and in-betweening, so we're excluding everything such as starting from scratch, or trying to discover what we're trying to animate. None of that. Anyways, let's roll through the drawings. The character takes a sidestep, and as he reaches to the other side, he dips down and flashes a pose. Then using his fists behind him, he gestures he punches the air and flashes another type of pose uh yeah gesture let me roll with you the overall performance once again let me just uh, get back to it and whoosh, whoosh, yeah and then another yeah and since we are working with a digital timeline i'll manipulate the frame so it matches the timing i desire one of the benefits of animating digitally it's fast now, think of this process like timing your regular drawings on an exposure sheet. Except in this case, it's digital. Like what I would do on paper. I would label my drawings so I know what order they go in, which are keyframes, which are breakdowns, and which are secondary breakdowns. I chose to label my drawings as letters. For example, the drawing here I labeled as A1 is a single underline. To me, this means it's a breakdown. The drawings I have where the letters are circled, that means I'm telling you guys this is a story key or a key frame. And what we want to do with these drawings is to space these out in a timeline or the digital exposure sheet over here. And we want to be able to finally add the timing charts. So I'm going to start spacing these out and I'm going to elaborate more on my thoughts process on why I'm making such decisions. So from drawing A to drawing B, I kind of wanted to gain momentum. So I wanted to start pretty slow and it end really fast. We're working with 24 frames per second over here. I'm probably gonna make the transition go for about four frames, but most likely I'll change it to something else. Since the spacing between A1 and B is still pretty huge, I'm gonna play it safe and make that last for at least, well, at max, four frames as well. And since it is gaining speed and momentum, I guess I should really emphasize this in the first drawing. So I'm going to make the transition between drawing A to drawing A1 last a bit longer, let's say six frames. From B to B1, it might go really fast, so I'm just gonna say two for this one. 
from drawing B1 to C, I'm thinking of an, a slow in. So I'm going to see how 6 frames go for this one. Anyways, I should advise that you guys keep rolling your drawings so you kind of get the overall movement and the overall momentum your drawings have. Because that can play a huge role when you're setting your timing or when you're manipulating the placement of your frames. Like for here, I'm already sensing where the slow in and the slow outs happen. So I'm matching those frames to a timing that I want. Like already here, I can read that it's going to have a lot more time in the beginning and then it'll go by the middle really fast and then there'll be more time of it slowing down. That's why there's more drawings needed in the last bit. Sometimes when I'm struggling about having a clear idea of what the timing is, I'll usually set it as a 4 as a placeholder. And then later, when I'm more confident with it, I'll go back and adjust it. I'm constantly rolling through my drawings, so I'm, I'm just trying to feel the overall drawings. And for this part where he snaps his pose, it looks like it's going to be really fast, so I'm guessing around in 2s or 1s. So just feeling these three or four drawings, I already know it's going to go fast. I don't need to put it as fours. I know I'm going to put it as a two or a one. So when he bounces up to this pose, I don't want it to go too fast or else the overall movement won't read. So I guess I'm going to resort to fours. So when I in between it and twos, it's going to read, but which I will get into later, I am going to time different parts of the body differently, like the head will move differently than the body, and I'll show you guys how to do that later on. Alright, important note here. Try and make it uneven as possible. When you look at your timeline, try and look at where your frames are and whether the spacing between the frames are even or uneven. And having less even spacing of your frames makes things more interesting. It's the same matter of working with asymmetrical designs and asymmetrical designs. Except here it's based on time and motion, but the overall feeling still applies. So it's important to think about things like rhythm. Rhythm creates things like weight and variety and interest, whereas if you have everything that's evenly spaced in your timeline and when you play it, oh it's gonna feel very floaty. And the problem with that is that it's going to make things uninteresting, weightless, and just not interesting. Anyway, sorry I got a bit off topic from the actual animation, but as you can see, I'm already thinking about things where the motion slows down, where it gains speed, and where things go by really quickly. So for my drawings G to H, I kind of want it to be a very slow slow in so it creates a lasting impact it'll go up for about 16 frames oh man that's gonna be a bitch to in between well there's my past let's see how this little shit goes all right okay um i guess this is the timing i sort of want i might change it later during production but i think this is good i think this is what we're gonna work with it, it just feels about right so let's start setting those timing charts now, before we add the timing charts, I just want to say that other animators usually prefer making the timing charts before they make breakdown drawings. I chose to do my breakdown drawings first, so it'll be easier for me to explain utilizing and understanding timing charts in general. Alright, now I already have an idea of how my animation is timed out. I tried to keep each movement uneven, and I'm constantly thinking about how fast how slow, how long, and how short each pose is supposed to last for, and how they should transition. So if I play it, the timing is all there. Everything seems to move at a rhythm I want, and you can see the variety in timing when Richard hits the poses I want. The question I'm asking myself is, how do I give myself that special instruction guide for in-betweening? As you can see, I timed out my frames before adding the breakdowns and before adding the frame numbers. Once I'm actually happy with where my drawings are on the timeline, that's when I begin to add and replace my labeled letters into actual numbers. Where drawing A starts will be my frame number. In this case, it's 1. And I usually match it with my letters. It's a keyframe. I'm going to circle that. My next drawing, A1, is a breakdown. And it looks like it's sitting on 7, frame 7 in the timeline. So as you can see, I'm basically matching my drawings to its placement in the timeline. I'm adding circles and underlines to indicate their breakdowns and keyframes. 
This is so that these drawings are now part of an actual footage and not just placeholders of where they should be timing wise. Thankfully, I labeled my letters with indications of what kind of drawings they have, so it'll be easier for me to relabel them when giving them actual frame numbers. I noticed this animation has a lot of keyframes, a lot of circled drawings, and that's really just how I work. I find it easier for me to organize my drawings this way. Some of you may prefer to label your drawings differently, and that's totally fine. As long as it works in your favor and that you're not struggling with it, then it's probably for the best. Alright, so remember how I said other animators prefer to do timing charts before they add any breakdown drawings? Well, this is because the timing on some of these keys may actually affect how the breakdown is supposed to look. How fast these drawings move will determine how intense or how pushed your breakdowns should be to match the timing. Or how subtle and soft these breakdowns should be. So after all my drawings are finally labeled as frame numbers, I think it's finally time to add our timing charts. So when putting these down, I always like to roll and flip through my drawings to understand the movement, and I'll talk to you guys through this step by step to further elaborate on my thoughts process. So from frame 1 to frame 7, I kind of wanted to start really slow, and then slowly gain speed. So just by hearing the sound of that, it sounds like a slow out, so let's make a chart between those two frames. So since it's a slow out, it looks like the midpoint of these two drawings would be the one that's closest to the next drawing. And it looks like it's going to be on twos and it's going to be an even half, so it's going to be five. Five will be the even half between one and seven. So between frame one and frame five, it looks like frame three will be an even half between one and five. And if you see the spacing on the charts, it starts out as really small and it just gets bigger. This will give the illusion that it's gaining speed. And because there's so much more drawings in the beginning part, it's going to feel more slow. Now when I flip between 7 and 11, the gap between them is so big and it looks like I'll only be doing one drawing, I'm going to give this an even half because it looks like it's constantly moving. So I don't need to pull off any thirds or favoring. So I'm going to make the chart. In between 7 and 11 is frame 9. And when I add frame 9 in the chart, it's an even half. So it's basically the midpoint between frames 7 and 11. So I'm just going to indicate this is our even half. Now I'm flipping through 11 and 13, and I'm noticing that this is such a huge, huge jump, huge spacing, and very little time. So it looks like for me to really do this justice, I'm going to have to make this into ones. The even half for these two is 12. Between 13 and 19, it looks like the action is starting to slow down. So the timing chart I'll need to make is called a slow in. It's when the action loses its momentum, and that's kind of what I want. So when I'm making these charts between 13 and 19, I'm going to do the drawing that's closer to my previous drawing. So in this case, it'll be drawing 15. So we need to do 15 first in order to get information for the in-betweens between 15 to 19 and then finally 17 to 19 and you'll notice it's just getting smaller and what I'm referring to is the spacing between how far these drawings are from each other looks like our next set of keys will be uh, a slow out so it's gaining speed this is when he's building the anticipation to whip out that other pose Sometimes when you roll through your drawings, you don't really need to add an elaborate timing chart. You just have to look at the drawing and I'll do most of the work for you. From 19 to 23, I'm just going to put an even half in between. It's because of the spacing within those drawings are so small already, and the spacing between 25, 20... Wait a second. Actually, I'm actually going to pull off a favoring here. I really want 19 to read, so I'm going to favor my in-between to that. But not too much, I'll probably make it a thirds. And then when I roll through 23, 25, and 27, it looks like it's already gaining speed even without the in-betweens. So because I see these drawings flying by really fast, I'm thinking of in-between these as ones later. No in-betweens and twos. So for these, I'm probably just going to chart these as ones from 
23 to 25, I'm going to put a 24, for example. From what I have already, it's already happening really fast. I'm just going to make it smoother later in the future. So there will be a 26 as an even halves. Now, when I actually look at 27 to 31, this is tricky because I don't think for something like this, I just in between it as it is. I'm really going to have to think about the context of the overall movement and what's actually happening. At this very point, he's actually dipping down and what happens after is he slowly moves into his next pose. But to keep things natural and fluid, you have to think about how each body part will move. So when I'm flipping through these drawings, the head and the torso is going to move differently from let's say the ears and the arms. Because in the previous drawings, I actually have the arms having a lot of overlapping action. So it's going to be doing stuff like delays from the body movement and overshooting. In other words, I'm probably going to have to make another timing chart for the arm alone. And maybe I'll just have the body move normally or just as an even half. I'm going to make the arm favor the next drawing or to be more specific, the next drawing of the arm. So let's go ahead and do a reference timing chart for that. So between frames 27 and 31, I feel like we're gonna favor the next drawing, which is 31. So I'm going to put my 29 very close to our frame 31. So yes, it looks like I'll have to deal with two timing charts at once. I should have chosen another an example that doesn't have to require this. So between frames 31 into 39, it looks like it's going to be a slow in. He's going to settle into that pose. So the midpoint of the chart will be closest to 31, which is 33. And then it'll just get smaller and smaller as it goes down from 35 to 37, etc, etc. Yeah, honestly guys, I should have chosen something that's a lot more simpler. I'm really sorry about that. Hopefully I'll be smarter and more simpler in my next tutorial, which is making breakdowns. And how you can make timing charts first before you implement those breakdowns. Alright, so between frame 39 to 47, it's going to be a slow out. So it's going to gain momentum. So since I'm doing this in the basic twos and all in even halves, my midpoint will be uh, 45. Looks like it's going to be a 45. And then when I add 43, 41, it's, um, it's going to start really small and then it'll just gradually get bigger, spacing wise. So since 45 is my midpoint of 39 and 47, I'll do that. And to get 43, I need to do 45 first. So I'll use 45 and 39 as my guide. And then once I hit drawing 41, I'll use 43 and 39 as my in-between and guide. Some of my breakdown and timing is already very tight, and I don't really need to add much timing charts. So in some cases, there'll just be straight in-betweens. When you roll through your drawings, you're just going to already feel the movement. And at this point, it's intuitive. When you're just working on it or just rolling through it, you're going to already feel the movement. Okay, so I noticed something between 51 to 55. It looks like it might be a weird favoring thing like I did with the previous ones. So I'm thinking for the whole body, it's just going to be a normal even half. But I feel like the hand is going to start the actual movement. It's going to start earlier than the body and the head. So I'm going to have it punch earlier. And when I do chart it, I'm going to favor the next drawing after this. So here's the thing, I feel like my approach has always been different when I switch from traditional animation into the digital medium. It's because of the ability to roll through or flip through virtually many drawings and I don't really place timing charts because skills like rolling and flipping through makes me more of an intuitive animator. It makes me feel the movements already so I basically in between by eyeballing which I have to say is not a good habit to have and unfortunately I do have that habit however when I'm animating on paper I realize I'm more careful in my timing choices I'd have an exposure sheet by my side 
and an exposure sheet is basically a traditional version of the timeline here, I'd use an exposure sheet by my side just to indicate where my drawings are, how far they are from each other, and really think about the timing from here. So like in my last video, this is why I recommend animating on paper once in a while. It makes you more decisive. The digital medium will always be a faster choice for me, but I realize now when I work with it, I tend to be more experimental in my approach to timing. So in other words, I'm going with my gut feeling. And you know what, that's not always a bad thing because you sometimes need to experiment with the timing for a thing that you're not familiar with or an approach that you've never really done or handled it before. So here, when my timing charts get too big, I actually make another mini timing chart that basically just continues the later numbers of my in-between. This is just for clarity's sake, really. And another thing I have to admit about my work is that I'm very messy when it comes to establishing my timing charts because I'm always figuring out if there are better ways or better options for timing. So from 59 to 75, it's a slow win, so it's just the movement, the spacing of the joints is just going to get smaller and smaller until it reaches to a full stop. All right, let's roll through my drawings. He starts off very slow and then whips to the other side really fast. His whole body dips down, his arm overshoots, and he quickly gets up, bounces up, and while he's settling down into his new pose, he, he there's an anticipation on his arm behind him. He does a quick swing, which drives the whole body. Then with his rock on gesture, he slows in into his final pose. Oh well, this looks like it'll be an asshole to be in betweening. Alright, now I want to show you guys a technique that will help you improve your in betweening work. This is a practice that was introduced to me by my mentor Scott Wright, and it has helped me a lot in retaining consistency with my drawings. So I'm going to make my first in-between drawing. Now looking at the chart, which drawing should I do first? Considering that the even half for 1 and 7 is 5, and a lot of other in-betweens refer to 5, I'm going to do 5 first. Here's a hint, you want to do an in-between that the other smaller in-betweens might need to refer to first. For example, in this chart, you cannot do an in-between of 3 without having 5 done first, because 3 is an even half between 1 and 5. So I'm going to make drawing 5 first. So I'm going to clear frame 5 so we can make a totally new drawing for the in-between. Now there are two things I want to elaborate on, which is the technique itself and relying on flipping over using the onion skinning or light table tool. Notice how I'm flipping rapidly between my previous drawing and my next drawing. The more you flip rapidly, you'll be able to notice the change in form and shape. This is useful for doing in-betweens with huge gaps between the drawings. Now, the in-betweening technique I want to show you guys is what I would like to call the point-to-point. -point. What you do, combined with the skill of flipping, is that you implement dots and points that represent a specific accent of what needs to be in-betweened. If there's a sharp turn or change in direction within the lines, you want to make a visual note to yourself that you'll need to keep in track with these things during in-betweening. How? Well in this example, I'm drawing points and dots first. This is a technique that improves observation skills, training your ability to see arcs and other hidden movements. I'm adding points based on where my accents are or where there's a lot of change within the lines and patterns. Then I would connect the dots like as if I was doing those paper activities where you draw a line and connect the dots to make a picture. So I'm using that same principle for these in-betweens. I'm placing dots and points on things like where his hair is, where his eyes meet, where there's more fur, where there's less fur, where the head meets the neck. Just important aspects that you might want to keep track of. The work of in-betweening is more than just adding lines in between the lines of your drawings, it requires maintaining a consistent performance as well, and that requires being careful with how you treat important accents within your character or whatever it is you're in-betweening. Anyways, I'm going to in-between this, I'll speed up the video a bit so we can get to our points faster. But notice how my light table is off so I can just focus on seeing 
the clear arcs, the movement, and making sure the accents of the character are consistent. Also, stick to your gut feeling. Sometimes you're going to have to do an in-between where it won't make sense if you just in-between or keep track of the shapes. Sometimes you'll just have to make a completely new drawing that doesn't really match with the in-betweens. It's fine. You'll just, you'll basically just have to feel it out. In between of frame 5, using the dot to dot method or the point to point method, it sort of helped me maintain a consistent in between between the two key drawings. So if you're trying to get better at accuracy and consistency, I totally recommend doing a point to point approach to your in between drawings when you're doing breakdowns as well. But remember, this is just one in-between out of whatever umpteenth you have to do. So let's move on. Let's work with frame 9 now, an in-between for frames 7 and 11. Now remember when I said that there will be cases where we'll have to in-between huge gaps and it will require to do more than just making in-between lines? Well let's say you have a character that's also turning their head during the motion. If you were to use a character like, let's say, Richard over here. And if I were just to in between the placement of the snout and the nose evenly from its first pose to the next pose, it's probably going to lose form. Why? Because most likely we're not thinking about the perspective or where it is spatial wise, 3D wise I mean. So with that in mind, this is tricky but you do have to treat the objects you're working with its form, its structure in mind and how it's going to look facing different directions in perspective. It's because of his nose extruding outside of his head, I feel like his 3 fourth front view of the snout would be closer to the previous drawing or where he's turned sideways. It's because we're really taking consideration of the length of his snout. Well, let's try and think it this way. Think of it as an arc that's happening at a bird's eye view of the character. The nose and the snout does follow a normal arc, but if you were to look at it in a normal perspective like this, you'll notice that the snout would probably favor one side or the other because it's adjacent to the arc on the bird's eye view. It's probably a strange concept to think about it at first, but I think once you get the concept and the idea down, you'll definitely try implementing it in your drawings. Also, if you feel like you've become more comfortable in being more bold with where your in-betweens are, you can become more gestural. You can just draw the basic shapes of the character. You can just draw them immediately without having to do the point to point technique that I was showing earlier if you feel more confident and if you want to be more decisive with your in betweens. That being said, you should always still do the point to point technique. I still do it when I am in between. Anyways, there will be many times where I'll speed up the video because in betweening is a lot of work and I feel like just watching someone in between for the hell of it is not fun at all so it's just best for the video consistency to just speed things up all right the next thing i'm gonna do is make an in between for frame 13 to 19. so when i look at my chart and when i roll through my drawings i can see that the action is slowing down this is a slow in and it's not just one drawing I have to do, it looks like I'll need to do six frames, so that could be two new drawings in twos. So I'm going to ask you guys, what drawing should I do first? Well, ask yourself, what drawing will the other smaller in-betweens need to refer to? I can't do 17 without 15, and 15 isn't even half between 13 and 19 so I'm gonna do 15 first so once I'm done with that I'm going to use that drawing to do frame 17 so again my top advice is to do the drawing that the other in-betweens need to refer to you can also look at how big the spacing the drawings take within the timing chart that can also help with choosing which drawings to do first then just work your way getting smaller as I am in between, you'll notice that I'm always constantly mixing between flipping, doing the point to point technique, and being gestural in my shapes. Another thing I want you guys to think about is the context of the in between. This is such a fast motion, what I'm animating here, between where he whips his hand across the screen. So I'm also going to think about dragging or overlapping action, where when he does whip his hand, 
His palm and his fingers would have this somewhat dragging motion to emphasize the force. Another thing I'm thinking about is I don't want the arcs to be too big. I want the in-between to be more straightforward and just easier to read. So I'm not going to move the placement of his hand too much. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull off a foreshortening where his hand comes closer to the audience. It gives it also more of a popping out feel. Something that could add that extra oomph in a very quick and whiplashy moment. So again, I'm an advocate of thinking about the context before actually implementing the in-between itself. Like how fast he's moving and the intent. I'm probably thinking a little too abstract right now, but I hope you guys are getting what I'm trying to say. Alright, now I'm working with frame 17. One thing I noticed is that there's still a lot of drastic change in the part where he whips his arm. In the previous drawing, I guess 15 in this point, the arm is more extended. Whereas in the next drawing, it's bent and his hand is now behind him. It's way past his torso. If I were to just do a dead on in between, it would look as if his arm is losing volume and that he would have missing joints. So again, imagine you're looking at this character from a bird's eye view and imagine you're in betweening his arm from this bird's eye view. At the same time, you're trying to maintain the arc of where his elbow moves, where his hand moves, and how his overall limbs move. And then once you grasp that idea and when you translate it into a perspective drawing like this, then you'll notice that the arm sort of overshoots or extends way more out than the next drawing. So don't be afraid to overshoot some parts of your character or whatever you're in-betweening. In fact, it could work better for them. It's kind of like choosing colors for painting. Sometimes you'll work with a color combination that doesn't look like it'll work at all, but when you do use those colors and when you do improvise with them, it seemingly works together. So part of the art of in-betweening is actually learning how to take risks with adding new arcs. Alright, so let's see what we have so far because I'm pretty curious how it looks like when we play it. Alright, so when I watch it, I have to say I'm not really a big fan of how the ears are working. It's because they feel a bit too mechanical and there's just not enough character and I feel like we could add things like overlapping action. So I'm thinking, what if the ear dips down as soon as Richard's head pops up? Using frame 13 where Richard's head pops up, I'm going to erase the ears or what I have of the ears and actually make it favor a down pose to give it the illusion that it's actually being dragged by the head, which is going up. Just think of things like weight distribution. It just creates more of a believability that there's a weight difference between his head and his ears, which 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 are more floppy. Alright, so in order for me to do frame 21, I'm going to have to pull off on an in-between and thirds, and it looks like frame 21 is favoring drawing 19. And again, it's in thirds, not favoring. Now, doing things like thirds is really tricky because it's not exactly full-on favoring one drawing over the other. You're taking consideration with the other drawing that's not favored as much, but it looks like it still has an influence. Whereas, if you were to do a straight favor, it's easier just to favor one drawing, but in thirds, you kind of have to find a way to mix both, but really show that you're favoring one over the other. Now again, there's a few reasons why I put this as thirds. One is because it's not it's going to read pretty fast, and two, I want to give a more snappy feeling between the transition, and if I were to even half it, it might feel a little floaty because you wouldn't be able to read the pose where he's standing straight up. I have to say, thirds I always find difficult and very annoying to do because it's there's a lot more thinking involved when making drawings for thirds. And the only time I see myself using thirds is when I really really want a key to read or when I'm animating something with a lot of very slow and subtle movement. And that's why I had Richard do something quick and very simple because it's easier for me to show you guys the basics of 
a timing chart and how to read them or utilize them. Well, I hope it's helping, but yeah. Now you might be asking if there's anything else that's trickier than doing a thirds. Well, what if you're dealing with two timing charts instead of one, and you have to show those two timing charts in one drawing? That can be a real bitch. But it's one of those things where you have to keep in track with what's moving and the context too. Again, the context. So, the primary timing chart I have on the upper right features Richard's head, his body, um, his overall primary bodily movements, the more bold gesture. The second timing chart focuses on his arms. I even labeled it hand, arm, or whatever, but as you can see, I'm favoring the next drawing. Honestly, if you just keep flipping and if you keep observing which, which is moving and what moves first, then I think it's actually not that complicated. It's just that you're using other things like secondary movement, overlapping action, and you can even show those in a timing chart like I'm trying to do in this case. When the head and his body pops up, I want the hand to come down and stay down for a little while. So here's one advice. One is just to focus on the primary movement first. So I'm just going to focus more on his head and his torso and his body. And I'm going to leave his hand alone. I'm going to add that later. So while I'm in between this, I'm going to try and think of other things to think about like overlapping action within the little hair tuft on his head or um, his ears, which I might actually just eyeball later. So I'm probably approaching this ear thing first as a normal in-between. Then I'll edit it later. This is so that I have a bit of reference so when I do decide to eyeball and straight ahead the overlapping action of the ear, at least I have a base reference of where I can transition the ear back to when I need to. Alright, so once I have the basic in-between of his head, his torso, the primary movements, I can now shift my focus on his hand, his arm, and his hand, yeah, his arm, whatever. And when I indicate it in the timing chart, it's favoring the next drawing. So instead of doing an even half of the hand transitioning to the next drawing, I'm actually just, you know what, I'm just gonna like draw a more, a pretty dead favorite to our, our next drawing. So it's kind of giving the illusion that it's overshooting and it's really extended and that it gives the illusion that the hand has actual weight. The bit where he does have his arms spread out will have more impact and weight because the overshoot drawing gives it a more forceful feel and that there's still a lot of energy within that arm. So my top advice would be to focus on the primary timing chart and then later move on to secondary timing charts, which, which depend on the drawing within the primary timing chart. I could just go through the whole animation talking about my every step of slowing in and slowing out drawings, but I feel like I'd be repeating myself without giving any new points across. I want to talk to you guys about flipping your drawing and using your light table or the onion skidding tool. As I have stressed many times in this video and the previous videos, flipping has many advantages, such as being able to see arcs clearly, changes in accent and shapes, while at the same time, implementing strategies such as the point-to-point -point method in order to retain form. Using skills like flipping and rolling allows you to feel the movement of the drawing without having to constantly play it to see what it looks like in motion. So when I do flip and roll, I'm not always second guessing where I should make the in-between or the arc. As I showed earlier, it'll give you opportunities to add new drawings in your in-betweens rather than just simply in-betweening within your previous and next drawings. But hey, animation desks have light tables, and Flash and TV Paint have the onion skinning tool. Some people are actually asking me through private messaging why I never use those tools, but the truth is, I do. I do use the light table and the onion skinning tool, it's just that I don't rely on it too much. So when I do flip and roll, it's mostly regarding big movements or things with a lot of spacing. When I use the light table and onion skinning tool though, I use it mostly to draw in the in-betweens for very tiny spaces. When I feel the in-betweens are too small, that's when I switch on the onion skinning or light table tool. 
This is where I can see my previous and next drawings as ghost images. Transparent images that represent the previous and next frames, basically. So from this point, all I can do is pretty much just draw in between the lines, literally. I'll still time to time flip between my drawings just to make sure some accents don't get muddy. But, because the spacing in between the drawings are so tight now, relying on flipping alone would just feel counter-efficient. So there you have it. I flip when the in-between drawings are widely spaced from each other and as I get smaller in my in-betweens and when the spacing gets more narrow, that's when I rely on the light table and onion skinning tool. It's a rinse and repeat process for every step of the in-between. When the spacing is big, you flip it. When it gets narrow, just use the light table really. So. Now that you guys have a basic idea of how I in-between, I'm just going to go ahead and finish the rest of the in-betweens on twos first. Because in-betweening is such a boring ass process to watch, I'm just going to show you a bit of clips of various stages of the rest of the in-betweens. Alright, so here is a collection of sped up clips of the overall process. I recorded a lot of screen capture of me animating, and I feel like talking about each of these steps intricately would be redundant for the whole video. So, friends of mine have been suggesting that I get a Patreon, and have this idea where if people do support the workshop, donate, and make pledges, they would, for example, have access to the footage of me animating with no edits, and no time manipulation, so people would have access to all my recordings of me animating in real time and with little to no voiceover so it's so you're basically gonna get raw footage if I were to do this what do you guys think of this idea would you donate just to see raw footage of my recordings of animation please let me know what you guys think that'll be really helpful for the future thanks so much for hearing me out anyways let's get back to it Alright guys, so after some time, I finished in-betweening everything in twos. And to many, including myself, that would be considered a finished piece of animation already. So as you can see, I'm previewing the animation with all my in-betweens and twos. And just by looking at it, there are some things I want to change before I in-between some of the things in ones. Personally, I'm not really happy how the transition goes between... 33 until frame 39. When he gets to that down pose, it feels like the momentum just suddenly dies. There's no slow in or slow out. It just it just stops. As I roll through the drawings, you'll notice the stop is really sudden. So I'm telling myself this thing needs a bit more cushioning. The frame right before 39, where the pose stops, 37 just feels way too evenly spaced, so there are several methods we can implement. One method would be to stretch out the transition so there will be more drawings for the cushioning, the slow end. That would be my number one instinct if I wasn't really strict with the timing, but th that's the thing. I don't want to change the timing at all, and if I do, I'm gonna have to relabel every drawing after this. So I'm going to do my best to retain the overall timing. This leads to plan B. Basically change the spacing of that one drawing that's bothering me, which in this case is frame 37. So for reference, I'm going to make a timing chart that will show you guys what my solution is, what my proposal is. Instead of having to change the timing for everything, I'm going to make frame 37 favor 39. So you get that cushioning effect, it's really short, so... I'm going to adjust the spacing of frame 37 so it favors 39, and the reason is 1. It slows into this pose, and 2. It's going to make 39 read a lot better, which I felt was way too abrupt in the original preview. So you could do a cushioning in thirds where it favors the last drawing, or you could just do a direct favor, which the drawing is basically almost the same as 39 with like a 10% influence of frame 35, your previous drawing. I could do a direct favor, it'll make things feel more snappy, but I kind of do want a bit of that spacing, that subtle spacing, so I'm going to go with thirds. Oh, and another thing, when I do use a light box, I do use it for things with very specific spacing or timing, like thirds or favorites. While I would flip, the spacing isn't broad enough, so I feel like if I were to flip and add my dots, I could easily mistake it as an even half. So yeah, I suggest using a light table in this, at the same time flipping so you still get to keep track of things like volume, form, 
and just consistency. Things like thirds and favorites can be really tricky, so, you know, just use whatever works for you in this case. Just to remind you, the reason why I'm doing this is so that there's more of an ease or more of a cushioning towards frame 39 instead of having that abrupt. And I feel like we can achieve a more cushioning effect. It'll go by really fast. It'll be really subtle. So as you can see, as I preview it, it's the same timing, but there's more of a subtle cushioning, which is the effect I wanted to go for. The next key correction I want to make is how the ears move between these drawings. The transition or the placement of the ears just, just snaps to its place and I kind of wanted to drag instead of having it snap. It'll add more character and weight to those ears of his. So in scenarios like this, I would sort of eyeball it. I would keep what I originally did in mind because it shows the default placement of the ears at least, but I do want to really play with that overlapping action with those ears. So as you can see, in my drawings, I'm erasing the ears and replacing them and approaching it in a straight ahead fashion. So there's my other note. If you aren't really clear on how the ears or overlapping stuff are supposed to move, just add them later and do them straight ahead. It's a more fun method and I feel like you can really get a lot of the character out by doing this. Once we're done, we're in betweening in ones this time. Alright guys, we're nearly done. There are some in-betweens I haven't done yet, and those are in ones. If I play I'm the tense. animation as it is right now, it works. No it ones. Like it's nothing, done. nothing, I um... Pass it on as an in-between demo. Subtle. But again, the thing I've actually charted some, a lot of subtle some drawings, I, as you can it. see. So it's important to have that. We can't add the a one in between. Ones so if we look at the, the timeline, we so turn the shit off. If we look at the timeline, giving those actions just lock ones that? will make the action feel fast and most importantly, smooth. 24, to we can as add a new giant in between. A uh, frame that's in this ones. 23 and Since 25. Since the movement is so broad, I... Since the spacing is so uh, big and I have it evenly spaced, um, I can just table. turn Anyways, off I want to talk to you guys about one. ones in general. While ones can make things smooth and give everything a high production value, you have to be careful on when to use it. Because if you give every drawing that's in twos an even half in ones, like everything, you're gonna get something that feels floaty and that feels like it's moving too much. The thing that's good about twos is that it's a graphical representation of how everything feels weight-wise. Think of doing ones as turning that graphical element into something that's more detailed and more intricate. So in a way, it can be harder and probably longer for someone to really feel the weight within the animation. So even in ones, you kind of do have to think about the spacing of the in-between, so it works. So my top advice, if you're going to do ones, use them wisely. Because production value wise, they're sort of expensive, both workforce and budget wise. Anyways, since we're on the topic of ones, there's another thing I'd like to show you that's just as important for in-between work especially for fast motion. Alright, so we talked about in-betweening in ones, but there's more to it than just in-betweening it in ones. The next thing I want to talk about is utilizing the smear. First of all, what is a smear? In my best description of what it is, it's basically a hand-drawn motion blur or a quick representation of a fast movement. I have to make an in-between in these two drawings, but the gap is so big and it's a huge powerful whipping motion, so this is where I'm thinking a smear would be good for this part. So I'm going to draw a smear frame in frame 26. When it comes down to smears or really big dramatic movements, I like to focus on the thing that has the biggest movement. In this case, it's its right hand. So the way I'm drawing this hand right now is I'm stretching it. I'm, I'm giving it a stretched drawing so it gives that illusion that there's, there's a motion blur going on. In a way, yeah, I am breaking the form and I am breaking model, but this is fine because one, it's a really fast movement, and two, it's basically a, a stylized motion blur, so it's meant to be felt but not seen. I mean, yeah, you'd be able to see it, but the important thing is the smear adds to the feeling of how fast it is. So I'm flipping back and forth while I work on the smear. This is just to see the relationship between one drawing to the next, and 
the way I'm treating the smears, I kind of want it to match the arc it's going through. My advice for smears, unless you're going for a stylized look, is that it's best for things with fast and short movements. Unless you're going for a very stylized look, I wouldn't recommend using smears for things on twos or you'd use smears all the time because what happens is that smears do give your character a rubbery feeling and while that does look cool, you kind of have to consider that it'll just make everything feel wobbly rather than having a concise form. A lot of classic MGM cartoons really utilize the smear. You guys should check out this old animated short called The Dover Boys. It's sort of very limited in terms of how it's animated, but the way everything snaps into place and the way they utilize the smear is pretty good. And to me, I just think it adds a lot to the comedy and the animation. Alright, so I'm going to preview this animation and as we can see, the smear is in place, but because it plays so fast, you won't be able to see it quickly, but I hope it gives the impression that you're feeling a sort of motion blur going on. If you look up images of smears online, you'll notice that there's so many ways to draw smears, such as drawing a swipe, or a trail of multiple drawings with the same frame, sort of like a Moybridge photo. Alright. We're beginning to hit the finishing stage. This is actually going to be the last part, I believe, and there are things I want to address before we end it. There's still a bunch of in-betweens on ones and smears I, I have to make, so I'm just sort of going to address them quickly. Within my animation, there's a part where he dips down and basically whips his hand down. I'm coming back to this because I realize there's a lot of in-betweens I need to do for this, and that there's a lot of more subtle things I need to address. And also, since it's fast movement, there's gonna be a lot of ones or in-between in ones. Now, this is tricky. I really love the drawing that's on frame 27. I feel like if I left it on twos, I could just be happy, but since there's a hand whipping motion and his cloth is all over the place and his fur needs to be addressed in a dragging motion, I'm going to add an even half for 28 but I really like the head, so I'm going to make a new timing chart where 28 actually favors 27. So when I do play it, it'll feel like the head is somewhat still on twos or has that weight as if it was on twos and then everything else would be constantly moving. And that's the sort of thing I, I want to achieve. So I've made a timing chart addressing this, making 28 really close to 27. So I guess that's another thing why a lot of people are reluctant to add ones. Because when you already have a drawing that reads really well in twos, like you feel the weight, you feel the idea, and the drawings just work well with you, then I would just advise the same thing, just leave it as it is. But if you want to add that extra oomph, or give it that extra snappy feel, then yeah, you can add ones, but you might need to think more about it because Again, sometimes adding in-betweens or ones in everything might give the illusion that things don't really have weight, and that's something I'm trying to avoid. But if you do manage to make it work in ones, and everything reads well, the weight is retained, it can make the animation feel more complete, more done, and it'll have that extra oomph. I keep saying that, and I don't know why. Maybe it's because I was playing Hitman Blood Money recently, and... There's a bit where you have to sneak in aphrodisiac into some dude's drink and the guy who gives it to you is like saying, yeah, this stuff is the extra oomph and everything. So I think that's where I got it. So when I just previewed my animation just now, yeah, you can see it has that extra oomph I was trying to go for. It just feels complete. So I'm just going to move along and find out all the ones I've placed out, all the remaining in-betweens I have to do in ones. There are stupid things I have to figure out, like head rotations, um, arcs I still need to figure out. So again, this is a laborious task, so I'm just gonna keep making the in-betweens, I'll just keep flipping between the drawings. If I was in-betweening cleaner lines and not going as rough as I am here, it would take me forever. And honestly, I just wanted to make a video or a demo talking about how to do basic in-betweens, how to track objects, how to time things with a timing chart, and how to know when to use ones and smears, and I hope that you guys got something out of it, and 
when I was making this video, I noticed that there were things that I felt were too confusing at the time to explain. So I'm just hoping that you guys got the basic intent I was trying to do. But I'm going to admit, there are times where I do want to make things a bit complicated to show you guys my thoughts process on things like that. But I do realize that in order for you guys to understand in between, even for those who've never done it before, to do more basic demonstrations, like a bouncing ball or just some guy rotating his head. But I kind of wanted to show you guys how you can implement it in your normal animation work such as character animation tests basically applying them to situations where you do need them for so it's weird I don't want it to be too confusing for you guys but I also don't want it to be too basic I kinda wanna get into that spectrum where basically anyone can follow up and I have to say I've learned a lot doing this it was kind of a big learning experience for me trying to articulate my ideas to you guys and how to explain my thoughts process that's something I never usually do and I just want to say thanks for checking this video out I realized that making the string bang videos have been taking a lot of my time and I recently got back into full-time work so this might be my last big demo in a long time I'll, I want to keep making demonstration videos but time is an issue I do have work and I do have projects of my own that I wanna grow I love sharing knowledge but I don't have the time to teach and that's why I make these videos why I make the string bing workshop is to share my knowledge through these video formats alright guys so I've already in between everything in fact, let's play that sucker right now. There it is. Patrick Standard's character, Richard, doing his thing in all ones and twos. I've stated before that I really love making these videos. I, I want to find time to do it, but I'll have to do them rarely nowadays because of the workload I have now and that I have projects of my own that I kind of want to develop. But thanks for watching, and there will be more to come as always. See you guys.